This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. It's my honor and privilege to introduce Georgiana Valois Sanchez, my tribal sister who lives down south, but whose family is actually from very nearby, and I'll show you that later when I'm into my slides. Born and raised in Southern California, Georgiana Valois Sanchez is Native American of both the Chumash and the Autumn peoples. She is an elder on the governing council of the Barbarino Chumash Council, the chair of the Chumash Elders Women's Council of the Wishtoyo Foundation as well. She has taught for the American Indian Studies Program at California State University, Long Beach, for over 26 years, teaching American Indian philosophies, American Indian literature, California Indian history, pre-1871 history, and ethnic experience in the United States. Her writings have appeared in several national and international publications. She is a renowned storyteller and board member of the California Indian Storytellers Association and co-founder of the League of Indigenous Voices in Story and Song. She continues to be a dedicated advocate for the preservation of indigenous languages, sacred sites, ceremonial practices, and traditional arts. Welcome, Georgie. I used to bring my dad's walking stick. He was born in 1897 uh, uh, for ceremony. And this is ceremony, but it really helps me to get around now as I become an elder. Um, before I introduce our speakers, um, I wanted to um, really make mention of Micah McCarty, who was unable to be here. Uh, he was the convener of the first Stewards Symposium, and we'd like to recognize all the work that he has done on indigenous issues and sea level rise, and we're very, very grateful and sorry that he couldn't make it. And Ben, you did a great job. I'm so proud of you. I always end up being everybody's auntie. Yeah, everybody's auntie to everybody's grandma, so I'm very proud of you. Um, our first speaker uh, will be Roberta Reyes Cordero from the coastal Chumash of Santa Barbara. Roberta has been a professional peacemaker since 1987, specializing in cross-cultural large group and family mediation. In 1995-96, with a small group of local Chumash people in Santa Barbara, she co-founded the Chumash Maritime Association, a nonprofit group seeking to revitalize indigenous maritime heritage. She is currently involved in a special project with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and NOAA. In this project, she is working with coastal indigenous communities to characterize tribal cultural landscapes for resource protection, as well as to develop protocols for tribal consultation in response to proposed projects such as ocean energy development. And we need that voice. Our next presenter is going to be Kalei Nuuhiwa. Uh, researcher and curriculum developer and first steward's witness. Kalei was born and raised in Maui, Hawaii, one of my favorite places in the world. Her primary discipline is Papahulilani, the study of all aspects of the atmosphere. In traditional Hawa Hawaiian worldview, these atmospheric elements embody the pantheon of Kino Akua Hawaii, 
and provide a fundamental function in ancestral memory, still essential in the modern Hawaiian consciousness. And that just really intrigues me. I just love that. She maintains ongoing studies of celestial alignments with sites situated in the Northwest and Maine Hawaiian Islands to understand traditional tracking of time and spatial measurements. I like it. Um, our next speaker is going to be Michael Williams, who I have been sitting next to, and I just already have such respect and such affection for this man. He is with the uh, Yupik, chief of the Yupik Nation. Michael Williams is from the small village of Akiak on the lower Kuskokwim River in western Alaska. Mike graduated from the Chemawa Indian School in Salem, Oregon, and served in South Korea as a member of the U.S. Army. In July 2012, Williams presented testimony from his community's experience with erosion and permafrost melt at the first Stewards Symposium, where he served as the Alaska panel moderator with the Alaska delegation. He currently works as a wellness counselor for his village and is also an avid Iditarod trail sled dog race competitor. And I saw some pictures. Really, really love that. Um, I, think, I think we've got all our people. So we're going to begin, I believe, with Roberta. Right? Where are you? Good. Okay, excellent. Thank you. If I can find the front of this, I'll be doing good here. Okay. I'm calling my presentation the Chumash Cultural Landscape of Goleta Slough. The cultural landscape approach looks at a landscape holistically. It includes the people and the effects of their interactions with the environment. We can also see that the environment affects the people, directly forming culture, or my favorite definition for culture, how we do things around here. Right? And that applies to all levels of culture that we exist in. I hope that this presentation will give you a sense of this landscape where we are meeting, both over time and currently, as it is always important to know where we are and how things work, or used to work here. In the time-honored style of uh, the time-honored way of storytelling, this story is meant to be thought-provoking without actually explicating the lessons. You will have to take those for yourself, and they will be different for each of you, I'm sure. Our families and stories tell us that since time immemorial, we have been here. We have always been here. The archaeological record so, so far says that Chumash ancestors we're already here 13,000 or more years ago. That's a really long time ago. It was before pyramids, it was before the Chinese Empire. I mean, you know, it's a long time ago. In this thumbnail sketch of looking at the geological overview first and then in a little bit more specifically the Chumash cultural overview, we see that at the end of the Pleistocene glacial melt, um, 120 meters or 393 plus feet overall was added to the volume of the ocean between 17,000 and 6,000 years ago. And we know that offshore from the mouth of Goleta Slough, which is very near to here, the old shoreline is about 200 feet underwater, 200 feet off the coast there. Before, before European contact, an extensive series of wetlands surrounded the present areas of UCSB and Isla Vista and included Goleta and Devereux Sloughs and UCSB Lagoon. So the Chumash ancestors were actually already here during that glacial melt, and they saw villages inundated over time. Did they carry the memory of that in, in their stories? We believe that they did. 
They witnessed and were affected by inundation of their coastal villages, and those events were memorialized. This um, slide shows a map of Chumash villages pre-contact. See if I can point out a few things to you. It's kind of stretched out here, but um, excuse me. Here is Sirtun, which you know as Santa Barbara. And here we are, I think that's, I can't quite see the, um, the lettering, but this is where, where we're talking about here. I believe that's correct. Um, <laughs> Point Conception out here somewhere. And the territory extended down to at least Malibu Rock and at least up to um, Morro Bay Rock, Morro Rock, and included the Northern Channel Islands, um, all of San Luis Obispo, Ventura, and Santa Barbara counties, and parts of uh, Kern and LA counties. It's a very extensive area. Um, now, just up the coast, if I can point it out, whoops, sorry. Um, <coughs> Just a little bit west here is where Georgie and her brother Johnny's family are from, the villages of Miku and Cuyamo that we know as Dos Pueblos. You see here a concentration on the coast of villages, and that's because of the many perennial creeks, which no longer exist as perennial creeks because of the kind of damming and uh, changing of the, of, the, um, of the water holders that happened early on um, after European contact, but that was because those perennial creeks contributed to wetlands at the coast, creating really abundant resources in very specific places. I want to highlight aspects of Chumash ancestral culture here um, at the time of pre-contact. This was a lagoon and for many thousands of years before that, it had been a lagoon, not a slough. It was a regional tomo, or canoe harbor, and major trade center. It was a key part of what Lynn Gamble calls the socio-politically complex Chumash network strategy developed to cope with variable ecological and climatic conditions. Those were the ways that we worked together to survive and to change when we needed to. The population in the Goleta Slough area that we now know as that area numbered about 2,000, and it was spread over several villages, such as Gila, which was on the island of Miskalatan Island, and Alkashash, I'm not exactly sure where that was, I'll try and spot it another time, Heliak, which is right at UCSB campus on the Mesa here, and Saaxpilil. Gila was on Miskalatan Island, it was continuously occupied for thousands of years. And we know that there was a burial of a beloved woman that was excavated in the 1800s and there were hundreds of pounds of shell bead money that was found in this burial. The presence of that much shell bead money indicated both her high standing and the wealth of the village. And it was also a practice that is believed to have been a means to avoid inflation of the money system, which was very complex and well established. From um, the name of Mescalatan Island, it comes from Mescalatitlan, and it was named by a 1760 expedition of um, Spanish soldiers, most of whom were um, indigenous Mexican people. They named it for Mescalatitlan Lagoon in Nayarit, Mexico. In Nahuatl, that refers to the Aztec heartland, a place where Mother Earth resided on an island in a lagoon. That lagoon was deep enough for post-contact ships to anchor until at least 1800, so it was a very, very nice harbor area. In 1769, Fray Juan Crespi was on, on an expedition also for the Spanish, and he said that just on, in Hilo, on Mescalatan Island, that one village, that there were more than 100 large houses, not less than 800 individuals, and 16 canoes. And we know that there were two freshwater springs on that island that supported that population over time. This is a map that was made by Philip Orr in 1943. He was an anthropologist that was associated with the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum. The dark areas represent villages, so you can see, oops, I keep doing the wrong button, sorry about that. Um, you can see here is Mescalatan Island with Hilo. Over here is Heliuk, and I'm, I'm not sure what the names of the other villages were, but I know that over here somewhere <laughs> along Moor Mesa, there's a, um, place that was called Wokwoko, and that's because there was so much asphaltum there. Woko 
means asphaltum in Chumash, and it was a very important building um, material, a material that we used for glue and other things. And wokwoko, in the way of the Chumash language, where you just duplicate part of the word, means a whole lot of woko, and it's still there. <laughs> And I want to distinguish that from the soft beach tar that we find too. It's a different, it's a different stage of, of that particular petroleum product. Um, here we see Galita Point, which I think we refer to as Campus Point in these days. The people comprised highly sophisticated sedentary gatherer-hunter societies made possible by the lavish local natural resources and complex trade ne networks. They also had well-developed local governance with accountable leaders, both men and women. That sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? Um, there was an overlay of regional and provincial governance, and this is how those really complex networks were formed and maintained. It is estimated that only 20 hours or so of subsistence labor were required for each person to survive and really thrive. I really like that idea a lot. Um, so we, come, we came up with some of the best basket weavers in California, if not the best. Pomo, Pomo might say something differently, but I think it was Chumash. Um, lots of story keepers, many kinds of medicine people, astronomers who really had very sophisticated knowledge of the, of the skies, religious and artisanal societies, and so on. It was very, very sophisticated. Had lots of times to just hang out. The current archaeology, as I mentioned before, dates ancestral Chumash presence in this region overall to 13,000 or more years ago. But I want you to keep in mind that our stories tell us about when the animals were still people, about the natural world and how we were supposed to behave. And they take place in actual localities and sometimes in crystal houses under the sea. This story is taken from um, two stories that are reported in December's Child, and they came to us through our ancestors, Juan de Jesus Justo and Luisa Ignacio, a survival story of how Coyote rescues Hedek from the El Elion, the swordfish people. It takes place in a coastal Chumash village. And the cast of characters include the village Wot, or Slo, you might know him as Golden Eagle, and along with 12 men and women of his on top or council, he governs this village and maybe one or two neighboring villages as well. In this story, we will meet three Tomo captains. This is Helek, Peregrine Falcon. He's Slo's nephew. And all of these three captains or skippers are excellent fishers as well. And Peregrine Falcon, we regard as the medicine for the Tomos and the captains and the crews, even still. We'll see their tomos. This is the tomo Helek. Here is a second captain. Hugh, you know him as brown pelican. We all know what a good fisher he is. And here's another tomo. This is Eliotwun. And Mut, another skipper we know as Cormorant. And he's a very deep diver. He gets those fish that he has to swim for underwater. And another Tomo, this is Muptmai. So we're gonna see what happens to them as they go deep. This is a white sea bass. And the picture that we saw before is Pacific mackerel. White sea bass like those a lot. We like these a lot too, but white sea bass is delicious. And here is the villain of the piece, El Yotun. He comes from the people of the sea, swordfish. And last but not least, the hero of the piece, Shipshiwash, coyote, when the animals were still people. Long ago, Long, long ago, when the animals were still people, 
The Tomo Captain Hillek went fishing in the ocean with Mert and Hugh, who were also Tomo skippers. From his Tomo, he saw a big white sea bass, so he threw his harpoon at it because it was really big. But just as he released the harpoon, he slipped and fell into the water and was grabbed by a huge Eliatwun. The Eliatwun carried Hillek away so quickly that when Hugh and Mutt looked and waited for him to surface, they just couldn't find him. Finally, they had to head back to the village before it got too dark to take their bearings from the mountains. When Slaw saw that his nephew Helek had not returned with the other two, he questioned Hugh and Mutt very closely, intending to send them after Helek. But Coyote, who was standing nearby, said, forget it. He won't come back because they have kidnapped him. Slaw said, what are you talking about, Shippishiwash? You're making up one of your stories. Coyote said, hey, it's no story. There are people who live in crystal houses in a village under the sea, just off the shore here, just as there are people here. That's where these swordfish people have taken Hillek. Of course, Slow was very worried about this, but he knew that Coyote was a very clever man, and so he selected Coyote to do the rescue, finally having to command him to go when Coyote protested loudly, as he always did. So the next day, Hugh and Mutt paddled Coyote out to the area where they had lost Helek overboard and agreed to meet back there in six days, hopefully with Helek. Armed with a case full of pespibata, which is a special tobacco mixture, a bag full of poisonous toadstool powder and his bow and arrows, Coyote plunged in. He swam to the bottom where he walked around slowly, looking all around him until he found the house of the El Eliatun. When he found their door, he gave it some tobacco now the door really liked that tobacco, so it opened wide and in Coyote went. There he found a very old swordfish man. He also found Hillock all wrapped up and hanging from the rafters of the house, apparently dead. He could see that the other swordfish were out hunting for the day, so he began negotiating with the old man to revive Hillock and return him to Coyote. The negotiations, which is just a polite way to say that a whole lot of trickery, deception, and magic was happening on both sides, went on and on and back and forth for several days. Coyote would first bribe the old man with his tasty pespibata, but then he'd blow poison powder over him to overpower him and make him sick, really sick. The hunters returned at the end of each day, a whale slung over the shoulders of each man. Each night, they would feast gluttonously and dance wildly almost through the night until Coyote was so exhausted he would have to eat his pespibata just to stay alert. Eventually, the El Eliawan forced him to go out whale hunting with them as a condition for Helek's release, and with his pespibata, he was able to keep up with them. Coyote also had to win a foot race with them, which he did using the time-honored coyote method accomplished by setting out poop decoy coyotes in relay so he could hide at the finish line. <laughs> in the end, he had to overpower all of them with his magic powder before they would relent. In exasperation, the old man swordfish convinced the others that Coyote would never leave them in peace if they didn't revive Helek and release him. So finally, finally, they did this. Indeed, they were so glad to get rid of Coyote and his magic powder that the kidnapper even showed him the way back to where Helek had fallen overboard so they could meet the other captains. Three Tomos were there to take them home, and everyone, especially Slow, the what? was so happy and relieved to have Hillek and Chippishiwash return home safely. And here they have their canoes in harbor. They doctored Hillek until he was his old self and could go fishing again. And Slo regarded Coyote richly. Sutiwayan ul atuk, so goes the story. That's how they tell it. Okay, so now we've covered about 13,000 years. Let's just look at a couple of centuries. <laughs> As I said before, at the time of first European contact, this area was a lagoon and a harbor. But um, let me just tell you a little bit about what happened to change it into a slough. In 1849, the gold rush led to um, a very big demand for beef and so therefore to an increase in the large local cattle ranches and then to overgrazing and erosion. Followed by, guess what? What always happens here after that? You get a fire and then you get a flood, right? We know this. 
in this case, a lot of floods, pretty big floods, and really incredible amounts of sedimentation happening in the lagoon, um, in the lagoon, which changed it to a slough. And then in the late 1800s, roads and dikes crisscrossed the area. Um, into the 20th century, we saw a landing strip get built here, 1942 to 1943, that became a Marine Corps air station, well, also an army base up here, um, which became Santa Barbara Airport. Much, much of Mescaliton Island and UCSB were removed for fill, removing all kinds of archeological material from those villages. They just got mowed into the landfill. Um, we see ongoing urbanization with wastewater treatment plant, major creeks flowing in, that um, bring all kinds of pollutants with them that you can, you can see, I've listed up here. It's pretty bad, we can't use the native plants very much anymore. Now I'm gonna take you just on a quick aerial tour of what happened to Goleta Slough, and I wanna show you where Mescaliton Island is um, in each of these, just so you can keep track. Here you see there's a lot of farms, 1929. This, I wish that these were uniform maps, but they're not, they didn't plan this ahead for me, unfortunately. Um, Mescaliton Island still intact, 1938. More intensive farming. And then in 1942, a Japanese U-boat lobbed a shell onto the land. There was no explosion, but there was, of course, an immediate reaction. And the response was that um, an army base was built. Um, did I get the right one? And you can see it's still under construction. And Mescaliton Island is still it's starting to, they've started to use parts of it here, so it's, it's decreasing. Um, 1954, here it is. We see mostly farmland, except there's some army buildings. You can see the campus in Isla Vista here. Here's Mescaliton Island, still pr pretty good, but changing. And now we, now we see that a lot of the farms up here have become um, um, subdivisions. Here we are again, 1986, 1997. The sewage plant is visible next to Mescaliton. See if I can point that out for you. I think it's right up here. 1998, a little clearer. See if I can find it again. I think it's right around over here somewhere. When you come off the, road, the highway to get, come to the campus, you go right past that island. There's just a little piece of it left. Here you can see a better picture of it right here. But you can see, so this is the sewage treatment plant and this island used to extend all around here. So what we have left in the 21st century is a remnant. This formerly was 1,150 acres Currently, there are only 100 acres of salt marsh, 200 acres of vernal wetlands, and um, totaling about 50 acres, smaller segments, salt flats, mud flats, and streamside environments. So it's greatly, greatly changed. But still very beautiful in places. This is looking north towards the San Inez Mountains. And this is looking east towards Schuchtun, Santa Barbara. And I want to just show you very quickly how we are, we don't live here anymore in this area, on these, uh, you know, not in the villages. And the plants have greatly changed. The resources are no longer available in large part. Um, but we are still crafting many of the items that our Chumash ancestors were able to make when they lived here. And I'm just going to show you what some of them are without going into details. Um, so these would have been either built here or traded for here. So we have five active tomals now, which is really wonderful. That is, that is a change just in the last 15 years. It's a big change. This is something we would have traded for. This is a beautiful effigy. It's only about this big, but it's just absolutely beautiful. We haven't seen this kind of craftsmanship in a long, long time. These are things that people would have made, everybody would have made things like this. This is, oops, this is a new, New traditional rattle, it's made from seaweed. The other things are, have a deeper tradition. This is probably at Lake Los Carneros, gathering tule, and I love these little dolls that were made there. 
we made our houses. This is a very small example of a Thule house, an op. And we say op, op, when we mean a lot of houses. These are at a village site at Nicholas Canyon near Malibu, and this is um, developed and run by Wishtoyo Foundation. Also made Thule boats and mats, all kinds of things. It's a wonderful material. Now we're moving to Junkus, another, another wetlands important um, resource. These are three different styles of hats. They're probably all made by Tima Link here. Whoops. This young woman here who's become a really expert basket weaver. She's just in marvelous things. There's a closer picture. There's Tima again. And this basket is our pride and joy in Chumash. We haven't seen a basket like this in 200 years of this quality and size. It's probably about this big. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And it also has, interestingly, some mission period elements with a prayer woven into the basket itself. And yes, we still eat acorns. Delicious stuff, very nutritious, more so than even tofu. and probably much more readily available if a lot of people knew how to do it, right? So, hurrah, it continues indefinitely. It continues. Thank you. Um, I greet you all with uh, a real significant uh, a chant that uh, is actually in um, response to the, our Chumash brothers and sisters who uh, welcomed us today, this morning. Um, it uh, basically talks about us all coming from the ocean and being of the same salt and um, being of the same land and knowing of each other. And so um, I acknowledge all of you that are sitting here today um, who come to listen to us, but I especially acknowledge those who are um, ancestral, a part of this land, and still uh, are rooted here today uh, in these days and times. Um, uh, uh, mahalo, aloha kako. <laughs> okay, so I have to um, preface my um, my presentation with uh, you know, uh, uh, an apology. I uh, was also affected by um, climate change coming here uh, from Hawaii. There was a, uh, a massive storm outside of uh, San Francisco and um, it didn't affect the plane that I was actually arriving upon, but the next one to get here to Santa Barbara, something about the altimeter, and if you don't have that, you don't know if you're up or down, which means <laughs> so it doesn't bode well. So I um, only had about four hours of sleep, so if the neurons don't fire off, my daughter is, um, is uh, tasked to help me lower my kite, so I stay on task. <laughs> Anyway, um, I'm here as a representative for, um, as a witness who participated in the first, uh, first Stewart's um, conference that happened in, in DC last, last year. And there were actually four of us. We, um, there were four witnesses. Uh, we were all invited to come and participate. There were various peoples from different nations from the East Coast of here, um, Turtle Island, and also from the West Coast, Alaska, and a large contingency from the Pacific. Uh, there were various Pacific Islanders from as far north as the Hawaiian Islands to as far south as the uh, so, um, Western Samoa Islands and the Samoan Islands, and as far west as the CNMI or the uh, Micronesian Islands that are up there. Um, we all came together and we we're all talking about the same thing, which is uh, what's happening to our lands and our islands. Um, so uh, I would like to start off, I, I started off my conversation uh, back in DC about a kilo. So everybody say kilo. Okay, and a kilo is someone who witnesses change. 
And we are all here as part of witnesses to change that is happening uh, to us today. And I'm hoping I get this right. Does this go right? Okay. So the word kilo itself um, has many meanings uh, in the Hawaiian culture. And the first is, as you see here, it means a stargazer, reader of omens, seer, astrologer, uh, even a necromancer. Okay, very important. Uh, and why that's important is that means that someone was tasked, or many people were tasked, to um, be the witnesses to mark the different things that were happening in order to align them with what's happening in the seasons brought about by the stars, the sun, and the moon. And of course, that happened over time. Uh, kilo also means to look earnestly, means to pay attention means to understand what's happening, um, to prognosticate what's about to occur because you have enough empirical data, right? Data that you've collected over time through all of these witnesses, you know, through experience, changing your methodology, adapting to that change, and being able to predict what the seasons are about to occur, what happened in the past, and what is about to happen in the future. Okay. To which you become an expert, okay? Um, and finally, you get well enough in your practice, you're an expert enough that you can predict the future. Um, and you can also do that by understanding what birds are doing, the barking of dogs, uh, the different activities of um, the plants, the animals, and people. Okay, so are we all on the same page here? Oh, I think we are. Sounds familiar, yes? Okay. Um, these are our natural indicators, and um, which brings me to us. Okay, these are the four witnesses uh, that got to witness climate change. Of course, I know that I sit amongst many of you who are actually currently participating in that as well. Okay, whether you want to or not. Um, the person on uh, your left, that's Nelson Canuck, and Nelson is a very young but inspirational um, gentleman. He's a student from the Kipnik, Alaska area. And uh, he was the witness that um, helped gather all of the information for Alaska and the northern parts of, of our Americas. Uh, there's me, okay, Kalei Nu'uhiva from Hawaii, talking about Pacific. We have the doctor, our doctoral um, candidate, Clarita, um, Left hand Bagay, and she is a Navajo woman, and she's also uh, f um, residing currently in Washington. And um, the gentleman on your furthest right there, that is uh, Ted Herrera, and he is a spiritual leader of the Tap Pilum uh, Tikin Nation of Texas. So we represented a large body of people, and we had to sit and listen to everyone's. Um, experiences on how they adapted to change. Because really, that's the message. How are we going to adapt? Uh, because climate change is happening. It's real. And one of the things that, um, that stood out for us as, as the witnesses is we noticed that um, everyone sort of had the same theme, you know, that, oh, oh I'll get into that uh, in a little bit so we don't get ahead of yourself, Kalim. Okay. Okay. What I want to say, though, is that uh, one of the main things that we notice is that we're all survivors. Every single one of us. We sit here. We've survived many different changes and challenges, and there are indicators, natural indicators, that help us continue to be so. One of the things that um, was very um, uh, prominent in many of the things that were being discussed is that. We are the litmus papers, the litmus paper, the people who uh, don't have a choice. We still live with our environment. We cannot help it. We still rely upon uh, the natural ecosystems. We, we rely on the cycles of certain animals, fish or plants, in order to survive. It's not a choice. So therefore, we are the natural indicator. When something is happening, we are the first to be impacted by it. And therefore, we are the first to try and figure out how we're going to adapt to that change. Or not at all. It, it depends. And if you don't, you're no longer a survivor. Okay. 
um, another thing that um, was a theme is that many people talked about how our lands and our practices define who we are as a people. Who we are as a people is not a choice. Uh, in Hawaii, um, you know, our diet is impacted. We don't have water anymore to continue eating our taro, which is our staple food. Fish are not around anymore. They're being overgrazed, they're overfished. So uh, we're forced to eat at McDonald's, if, you know, or be, um, uh, you know, the, our, our water so sovereignty is not there anymore. Uh, our water security is not there anymore. Um, food security is not there anymore, so we're forced to adapt, but um, uh, not that we want to, we have to. Okay, anyway. Um, okay. Together, the four of us put together um, a, a uh, paper, and um, you're more than welcome to get our, our table. Uh, which I think I sent on the Dropbox. I don't know if that's available to everyone. Uh, and what we did is put, put together, amalgamated everything that everyone said and put it together and tried to put them in different categories. Um, we listed problems. We listed sometimes a certain um, uh, tribe would be able to discuss about a problem and then thank you very much. And then would um, another tribe would talk about the solution. Okay, so I'm gonna... Uh, we're still connected to the environment, as I was saying earlier. We still need to hunt, we still need to gather. Therefore, we are the empirical data. We are the ones who can provide knowledge to those who are policy makers. Okay. We have spent significant time on the lands that we reside upon, multiple generations, which means we are noho papa. We come from a certain place for many, many, many generations, have observed changes over many, many generation, so we are able to give uh, knowledge that might help with solutions on how we can uh, survive the change that is about to occur. Uh, one of the things is adaptive methodologies, um, empirical data to survive. Again, we have that knowledge, we need to share it. Um, we are the litmus paper for health and the well-being of our lands. Technical, um, sorry, TE. TEK found in our stories and chants are indicators on how we can prepare and survive the change. Um, we have to recognize that there are differences. For example, in the East Coast, they're a little more, um, they're a little more proactive in how they've accepted that there are changes, therefore they're already uh, proactive of how they're gonna deal with that. Uh, the West Coast, on the other hand, those folks are being inundated by water, by ocean, um, by the relocation of their people, their families, uh, their populations, uh, all of that. Um, and so they're being impacted profoundly uh, and therefore are dealing with it. They're, um, it's not a proactive thing, it's what am I gonna do? Uh, Alaska, on the other hand, uh, what happens to them, you'll get to hear that from Mike. And, um, uh, theirs is actually, to me, the most vivid uh, story to tell about how they're being impacted, their, their communities are being impacted. And finally, us Pacific Islanders, most of us, you know, we're not afraid of the ocean. Uh, we've got stories where we've sailed. In fact, we have stories that we've come here. Hilo, for example. Where did she go? Yeah, that's one of our navigators. So hey, we, we populated you guys, you didn't know that. Okay, <laughs> we have Maui, we've been all over. Uh, we've had Kuali'i who came in the 15th century. You know, we t so we've, we've got no problems with the ocean inundating us, although it is a problem. However, historically, we'll get on a canoe and, and sail. So we're not really afraid of it. We're a little more uh, lax. Um, uh, relaxed about, about how we're gonna deal with that. And it usually has to do with the tourist industry, right? <laughs> Not necessarily with the indigenous people. Okay, so finally, um, uh, and you know, it's hard to say everything in 15 minutes. I just wanna, want you guys to know that. Whew. Okay, so, <laughs> so I'm gonna end with something okay, um, called small kid time. This is something that we do in Hawaii, and I'll try and wrap this up in two minutes because I know that's all I have. And what small kid time is, is um, 
It's for, so it's just an exercise for all of us right now at this moment. And what I'd like you to do is to uh, sit and think about when you were a little child, okay? Sit there and talk about it. If you can close your eyes if you want to, uh, re and, and kind of rewind the tape back to when you were a little person, okay? Just a little kid. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll just stop talking while you think about that for a little bit. And all of our experiences are a little different. Some of us have uh, uh, memories of running through the forest. Others have memories of um, <clears throat> running through the beach or, or playing with our grandparents or having um, interaction with our siblings. Uh, it's a free time, right? It's a time when we're all allowed to be who we need to be. It's, it's, um, it's usually got to do with being able to fish however you want to fish, being able to gather however it is you want to gather, being able to just be free on lands that are clean and healthy and sustainable, yes? Some of you might have memories of being a small kid, you know, in the city or in the town uh, or a developed area, but it was a free time and it was a safe time, am I correct? Okay, it's really hard to get away from that, right? Once we think about it, we... Okay, so here we are as a people today with climate change about to occur, uh, well, not about to occur, occurring, okay, to us right now. All we ask, right, all we want is that our children and our children's children uh, be able to have that gift of being free, happy, and carefree, yes? Okay, then let's do something about it. Mahalo. Good morning, my name is Mike Williams. Uh, I'm from Alaska and um, yesterday morning I took a, a truck coming down from um, my village on an ice road and it was 20 below and I hated to leave and get down here to a 60, 70 degree weather and I'm suffering. <clears throat> I have a right to be cold. Thank you very much for inviting me, and um, and uh, of course, uh, English language is my second language, and um, and I really appreciate uh, the um, discussions on sea level rise, um, and uh, I just uh, uh, really uh, appreciate uh, the depth of discussions and uh, all of those previous uh, indigenous presenters. Uh, talked about what I was going to say. <laughs> but anyway, I really appreciate uh, the um, experiences throughout the indigenous nations. And, um, and in Alaska, um, I want to tell a little story in very few minutes uh, so we can have questions and answers. And, um, and I just, again, uh, really appreciate um, um, you know, the um, um, telling stories. And, um, and as a Yupak person, uh, and listening to stories, 15 minutes isn't enough. And, um, and I just, uh, uh, you know, as a Yupak person, we're not uh, real time conscious, but um, we like to, um, you know, uh, listen to my grandmother telling these stories four hours, but uh, 15 minutes, I, I guess, uh, can do the um, uh, impact. Um, but um, as my um, uh, wife, who is a teacher, said, Mike, you got to keep it down to 15 minutes, and you, you, you can make sure that, um, that uh, there is retention. Um, I think um, um, we are impacted um, up there and 
As Alaska's native peoples, we have relied on the lands and waters for our nutrition and traditional subsistence uses since time immemorial, and we heard that earlier. Yet climate change is wreaking havoc in Alaska. We are experiencing melting sea ice, rising oceans, rising river temperatures, thawing permafrost, severe erosion, and dying forests. Our animals are at rise, and, and, and as a consequence, so are our communities. Yet we are st uh, strong people and are taking creative steps to find a path forward. For the future of our children, we look to our elders for their wisdom and guidance. And uh, I just came off the Iditarod Trail a few weeks ago, a thousand mile race across Alaska and it was, and it was terribly warm. And, um, and I, we had to uh, swim across the sloughs and uh, the dogs had to swim across the sloughs. And, um, and in my 15 Iditarods, um, it's getting more and more challenging uh, to um, cut across Alaska every year and seeing the changes that I'm seeing uh, firsthand and uh, also uh, in our communities um, uh, where we live. Uh, you know, the uh, thinning of ice and, um, and um, the, um, um, our hunting and gathering is more challenging and people are going through the ice and, um, and those are things that we are witnessing. <clears throat> Um, and I think, uh, you know, with um, uh, Senator Biggage and our uh, uh, traditional chief, uh, my uncle was a traditional chief of our Yipi people, uh, but uh, he has uh, passed on. Uh, but um, Paul John is a, an elder, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Senator Biggage is the one that uh, is really in support of um, uh, doing something about uh, the impacts of climate change in our, in our villages. And you just uh, um, heard about one of the witnesses, uh, young Nelson Canuck, and, uh, and uh, he was um, our, um, our uh, witness. And, uh, and he lives uh, about 100 miles uh, west from my village. And, uh, and he has a wonderful story to tell, and um, he is um, one of the young men that has taken on um, uh, through a legal challenge about his existence and his village. So Nelson is uh, served as a witness along with um, our friend here from Hawaii and two other witnesses. Um, I. I'm, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Alaska is sur surrounded uh, by all of the water, and we have uh, 6,600 miles, which have constantly ch is ch constantly changing due to wave action, ocean currents, storms, and river deposits. Alaska en encompasses 365 million acres with permafrost found over approximately 80 percent of the state. And there are um, 229 federally recognized tribes uh, living throughout Alaska. And I'm from the West Coast, and, um, and um, <clears throat> there are going to be about 180 communities that are going to be dealing with um, being underwater in 50 years in a very short period of time, and especially in my area in uh, western uh, west coast uh, which one of my villages uh, is slated it's already in middle of the river but uh, but it has sunk into um, 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 the river already but uh, we're having to keep moving back uh, a typical alaska native village um, you know has um, uh, infrastructure and um, and many of the, our communities still live in third world conditions. And this is uh, Kivalina, a small village um, that is, um, has filed a suit um, uh, because look, uh, look at 
the community and it's vulnerable. And, um, and uh, storms have hit the community and there was no running water this winter uh, in the schools and they had to melt snow, melt ice to drink water. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, one of the villages that uh, are looking to move um, in Alaska. And, uh, and um, you know, I think uh, uh, we're gonna be um, looking, uh, you know, we're gonna, ha we're gonna have to live th with the changes and, um, and, um, and uh, we're fighting for our survival up there. And, um, you know, with the whaling and uh, with the drying of fish, uh, we had, uh, um, we had more challenges in drying fish um, in the past few years uh, because of um, um, unpredictable warm uh, storms and um, and it has been wet and um, and um, our um, um, uh, our villages have uh, really uh, been uh, really impacted by the change that we are seeing. And uh, many of the uh, fish drying has uh, really, uh, you know, they spoiled and uh, my dogs are happy, but, um, you know, we um, are sort of um, um, uh, dried fish for our survival right now. And this is my community and um, and we have um, about 350 people there, and we um, depend on salmon and moose and other um, other species, um, uh, caribou um, in Western Alaska, and um, and and we were the regional hub in the area uh, when um, illnesses hit us. Um, we um, um, uh, we um, had a hospital there, and um, a lot of people died and uh, uh, were buried in the community. And this is my dog yard. The village is um, used to be down in the river, um, and um, and the old village sites has completely fallen to the river already. And uh, those are my. Uh, puppies, and, um, and they are my Hawaiian puppies. That white dog, his name is Wahini, and that do uh, pup on your left is Hapa. And uh, I had a, a Hawaiian handler that um, named these puppies, but they did well on the um, latter Iditarod runs. Um, the um, uh, the community uh, right now, we're bracing up for another flood and we've had disasters of floods in the past and uh, the tanks are gone right there. Uh, all of that land has eroded and those tanks have been moved away. So there, those uh, oil tanks uh, are, um, uh, are gone. And, um, and this used to be um, uh, where uh, uh, the cemetery um, you know, the human remains were there, the, you know, the people that came, and there were a huge amount of deaths occurring in our community, and, um, and there were hundreds of, um, uh, of um, uh, you know, people buried, and that has um, uh, began falling into the river, and it took um, an enti entire summer for all of our young people to working together to move the cemetery. And um, as a counselor, I had to um, deal with uh, the issues um, of um, uh, breakouts and uh, depression and um, when uh, those workers were moving um, the rem human remains every day throughout the summer and they were working um, like 15 to 18 hours a day and moving those human remains. And this is my uh, smokehouse, and um, and I had to move it. Uh, uh, this is the third time, and uh, it's already uh, after uh, this fall storm. Uh, this uh, 
smokehouse need to be moved and um, and uh, it just uh, it just uh, really um, um, uh, terrible and uh, and there are more stories in Alaska and uh, uh, new talk is uh, currently being moved right now and um, and uh, I just uh, uh, spoke with the uh, tribal administrator there. Uh, they are moving um, the village um, piece by piece. But there's uh, political issues and people lived there for many, many years and they grew up and were born in the village of New Talk. But um, those elders hate to move uh, to a new location because of the traditional um, areas and their attached to that, but they have no other choice but to move. Uh, Shishma Kivalina, you've seen that, is in process of uh, um, looking at different places to move, and uh, Shishmaref um, um, is uh, also uh, looking at different areas to move. So we're also, Akiak, uh, where I'm from, um, we're also looking to move um, uh, soon. Um, and, um, and again, 180 communities are in uh, jeopardy. Of, um, and uh, the um, GAO um, did a research and um, it would cost each community uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 million to 400 million dollars to move. And, um, and who is willing to pay for it? Nobody is willing to pay for that. But for the most part, um, um, the land is also in, uh, in question uh, because um, you know, the state and federal um, has uh, selected lands and um, the native uh, corporation lands have selected and um, nobody wants to give up land. And um, where do we move? Uh, it's a big question and it's a huge political challenge to deal with uh, those issues. So in Hawaii, you know, we've s heard stories. Uh, lastly, um, um, asserting native resilience. Um, um, it was done by Zoltan Grossman and Alan Parker from Evergreen State College and uh, Pacific Rim indigenous nations face the climate crisis and it uh, has been forwarded by Billy Frank and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the story I have in there is uh, what I testified in Congress uh, with uh, Representative Marquis' uh, 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 Committee on uh, Global Warming and uh, uh, that is affecting the vulnerable communities throughout the Pacific and throughout Alaska and throughout this nation. Uh, again, uh, thank you for inviting me and we're gonna be around and, um, and uh, contact us uh, any time during the year. And again, um, thanks for inviting me again and uh, I feel um, like, um, you know, we need more time for discussions, in-depth discussions, um, and um, hopefully the next 15 minutes uh, will do it. But if, if not, then um, get uh, our emails and our phone numbers and we'll be, I'll be willing to talk to you more in depth. Thank you very much for it. glasses this morning and there was a lady from United Kingdom that punched me. Oh, no, I uh, adjusted <laughs> them and I broke. <laughs> Thank you. So I've been back there taking notes. 
there are so many things I'd like to ask. Uh, and what the way that I wanted to do it is I wanted to present it to the whole panel so that they could discuss amongst themselves and uh, either find solutions or just uh, uh, tell us a, a story that will inspire or enlighten us or educate us. And then what we're, we're going to do is open up the floor so that uh, one or two, is about all the time we may have, uh, will ask a question to either all the panel or any member of the panel that you'd like to hear a little bit uh, more from. I heard a long time ago from an elder that freedom is an inside job. And um, as we all know by these amazing people, uh, we know uh, learning once again uh, the extreme threat of climate change and how severe uh, the, the situation is to us as human beings, the sea level rise, that these are actually issues that touch upon human rights. And if freedom is an inside job, I mean, no one, especially Native peoples, we began to realize that if we don't do it, if we don't push the envelope, uh, that, um, that often things do not get done. And like someone said, uh, that we are the litmus test, we are the canary in the mine. But often, because we are Native people, we are the last people that oftentimes people want to listen to and we should be the first because we were right there on the front lines and have this particular relationship with certain bioregions. So hope I can say this right because it's, it's like a big question. Um, I believe that how we think shapes our reality. And I heard you say some of those things. Mike also, as we were talking down there. Roberta, I know for years, you know, <laughs> And so I guess my question to all of you is, how do we address our communities? I mean, really practical, the people we live in with, the people we see every day, our young people, our old people. How do we, because many, they know what's going on, but they don't really, are not either accepting it, they're hoping things are gonna get better, you know, those kinds of things. So how do we communicate the uh, severity of where we are in regards to climate change and sea rise within our own people? And then because of what Ben said, how do we then begin to reach out globally? No, that's a, that's a big question, but it's something we have to do every day. I don't know. Let's see. Well, I think uh, we heard the stories um, in Swiminish, um, you know, what the people in Swiminish in the Northwest are doing. And in my community, um, we were hit by uh, severe storms and, uh, and erosion. And we're, we've been meeting as a community, how can we mitigate, how can we adapt uh, to these challenges? And, um, and we uh, felt like uh, we want to tell our stories. And that first stewards um, meeting last summer, uh, I think, uh, accomplished some of that uh, mm -hmm. contact with uh, federal agencies and uh, our policymakers, the representatives and senators that were um, involved, along with the Senate Indian Affairs uh, Committee, and. Um, you know the administration and and uh, federal uh, and state um, uh, managers need to um, hear our stories, and I think first stewards uh, meeting accomplished some of that awareness, and uh, and I think uh, we're bracing up for another uh, first stewards two this coming fall in mm. Washington, D.C., mm. and to begin to uh, tell our stories, um, not only telling these stories, but to urge them, to urge Congress and administration to take this as a priority. And, um, and I believe um, with the new Secretary of State and other policymakers that um, have brought this uh, issue of global warming and climate change up. You know, we have a chance right now, um, and we have a window of opportunity, and that small window of opportunity is upon us, mm -hmm. and we need to take action. Yes. In my community, it's a little different. 
um, there's actually only small changes. And uh, we're so busy um, trying to restore our knowledge, <laughs> our traditional knowledges, you know, um, and going back into the chants and our stories. And a lot of it was recorded in the Hawaiian language newspapers over about 100 years of information has been recorded. They, they, um, they being the elders, felt it was, well, wrote with a sense of ur urgency to try and record everything. So my, the Hawaiian community is really busy with trying to restore that knowledge again yes. and to understand it and then, and on top of that, try and bridge it to today. You know, mm -hmm. how can we use, oh. utilize that information for today in a contemporary world? Yes. And so um, for us, we notice things like um, our winters come later small change, not a big change. Uh, we've noticed that some of our migratory birds that fly to Alaska or Russia uh, are deciding not to mm -hmm. and are staying. Um, the whales have been coming later and leaving earlier. Mm -hmm. So it's like really tiny, small changes like that that's occurring that if you are not um, knowledgeable in what the natural cycles have been over time, you wouldn't notice. So therefore, it, it's, it's um, for my community itself, it's not really uh, important right now because they don't see the big changes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and tacking on to what uh, Mike said earlier, I think it was at that symposium where we heard stories from everyone else's communities that it became real. Um, and the issue of, of uh, ocean acidification became real. Mm. You know, sea level rising became mm -hmm. real. Permafrost disappearing where the tundra is just a, a marsh is real. I'm looking at real people being impacted by that. And I think that's really probably the active mm -hmm. way of how we can, um, you know, bridge that across. And watching Ben's um, uh, presentation this morning only made it, uh, you know, it's who's got the big gun versus who's got the voice and who's being impacted. Wow, I was blown away by that. And um, even in Hawaii, there is a movement for idle no more as well. Yes. So, yes. Um, yes. you know, it's, it's an active movement. So anyway, great. Thank you. Good. You know, what she said? <laughs> yeah, what she said. Uh, we have a lot of the same phenomena here, um, phenomenon here, phenomena. Um, having to do with trying to revitalize our understanding of our culture and we and you saw some of the examples of that in the slides that I showed you and so um, I think that probably the main threat to us as a people the Chumash peoples is that we have most of us have become separated from our knowledge of the land and the ocean mm -hmm. and the things that we've been trying to do have been an attempt to bring us back to that and without that connection you don't have that passionate love for taking care, which mm -hmm. is still, it's still our obligation as indigenous peoples yes. to take care whether or not we have access to those places. Mm -hmm. um, and at First Stewards also, I had that same experience of, you know, oh my God, this is so, it's so big and it's so right there. And um, I am personally struggling with how to bring that to my people right. here, you know, how we, how we bring that here. Mm -hmm. Because, um, so far, the things that have been happening here and are measurable can be s construed as being within the normal large cycles that we see here. And so they're not really felt that much um, or understood that much, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so, you know, I think that probably the, the way of thinking that we need to engender the most and support the most is that we are all children of the same mother on this earth and we need to connect with one another. We need to have compassion for our differences and embrace those differences as well mm -hmm. so that we can work together. We, we absolutely have to work together. Mm -hmm. You know, Oren Lyons once said that one thing that indigenous people who have lived in a particular area for thousands of years is that we have this long trajectory of history that we can actually almost look back and see centuries of stories of living on a particular, I'll call it a bioregion, your particular homeland. And with that comes this incredible knowledge that a lot of our young people have forgotten. But what we say in our communities, and I don't know about it, you guys, that it's not lost and it's not dead, it's just sleeping. 
And so it is up to us to awaken that. And I am so happy to hear that the first stewards gathering did that for all of you. And then, then there's the imperative that we got to get out there and do something. It's like, you, you can't just, you've got all this knowledge and you can't just sit there and, and, and not do anything. It's almost like you are, you are called to do something. Are there any people out there who have questions? Because I, I was just, uh, my mind was just swirling out there with, uh, with different ideas. Uh, yes, I see two people here. There's one woman in the front and someone way in the back. Someone over there. Thank you. I wanted to ask Mr. Williams, we know that a lot of Alaska villages have already had to make a lot of moves, adjust, and so on. And I'm wondering if anybody has helped you with either planning or money to get those moves made. Yeah, with the village of uh, New Talk um, and with, uh, in communicating with him, um, I think some of the federal agencies like the Army Corps of Engineers, um, you know, have uh, limitations of do, uh, what they can do in terms of uh, moving. And we have, um, you know, housing and uh, other uh, health agencies that um, ha have that capacity. Um, but uh, uh, it has been like piecemealing um, you know, each, um, you know, if they're going to uh, make a house, house, then uh, they're building one, two houses, or, um, um, you know, moving um, a, the water um, <clears throat> plant. And, um, and, you know, I think uh, there needs to be a contemporary uh, planning, I think, to, you um, uh, move these communities, and I think the federal government and the um, um, uh, congressional uh, folks need to take action to help um, these uh, communities uh, um, to deal with the infrastructure. And uh, and I think it's uh, the go federal government has a trust obligation to the uh, tribes uh, of this nation, and mm -hmm. uh, you know for. The most part, um, you know, in the budgeting process, uh, we pay big time for it. Uh, you know, the cuts and while well, our people are suffering with health care and uh, housing issues and uh, infrastructure, clean water uh, to drink, and uh, you know, we're um, you know still live in third world conditions in in Alaska, and um, and our people are continuously dying and um, but I think uh, the federal agencies uh, uh, need to uh, coordinate better and I think uh, with uh, the first stewards um, holding big meetings like that in the in the community of uh, um, DC and where all the resources are I think uh, you know we can begin to uh, um, uh, to make impact uh, and change some of those minds that are naysayers uh, in Congress uh, that uh, deny they are still in denial. And uh, and as a counselor, you know, uh, when there is a problem, then we don't have a problem. And I'm dealing with denial all the time right. as a wellness right. counselor. But mm -hmm. no. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Mike, and as they're starting to plan to maybe move the people. Are they able to stay fairly close to their original homeland, or do they have to be moved far away? Yes, uh, I think uh, with the village of uh, New Talk, um, they're moving 10 miles, at least 10 miles away inland, uh, but that's uh, still far away from where uh, they were born. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think uh, you know, with the events like uh, uh, salmon are disappearing, um, you know, we've. Uh, you know, we have a trial um, getting started for next week. There's 22 fishermen that decide to go fishing because we were hungry last summer. Mm. We weren't allowed to fish for mm. seven days. So uh, our elders said, go fishing because we're hungry. Mm. And um, then uh, we went out fishing and were arrested uh, for fishing for to feed our families. Um, so we're going to have a two-week, um, two-week, um, um, trial um, 
which uh, some of them were already convicted of um, fishing uh, during the time when it was closed. But uh, our elders uh, uh, said, uh, go fishing. And, mm -hmm. and I think our resources are being affected as well with uh, mm -hmm. the impact of ocean and acidification or other impacts um, uh, that are happening inland. Mm -hmm. There was another hand way back there and then over here. So did our, now that was our next one back there. Hello, I'm a marine biologist and a professor at Antioch University in Santa Barbara and I just started a program about environmental justice and advocacy. And I teach a lot of classes about climate refugees and UN policies. And my students are now asking me questions that I don't have the answers to. And one of them is a lot of these you know, indigenous groups are affected more by climate change than other groups. And they're not the ones that are you know, putting all the carbon in the atmosphere. And they're not even the ones that are affecting this change, but they're, they, their lives are changing. And how do we collaborate with indigenous groups and keep in mind, you know, being sensitive to cultural differences and um, social justice type issues. Does that make sense? Oh, that's a tough that's one. I guess that's why we're here. They're all pointing at me like I have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 15 minutes is really hard to get everything in there. Um, <clears throat> okay, to answer your question. Whew, um, You know, a lot of us need time just to even think about it, the in, uh, indigenous people. So, uh, and we're not allowed that time to actually sit down and talk about it and think about it in our, in, in our own frame of thinking and how we can actually answer some of these questions or uh, attack some of these problems. Um, it, it's, it's imminent, it's going to happen and, and You know, I'm searching for like really good words to say, you know. Can I, can I, can I meet after with all of you and give you my cards and continue a dialogue? Sure. I don't think there, I don't have yeah, I don't, I, I, you know, um, I think dialogue is great. And I think the ability to get together and talk to one another about it is important. And, and then you don't know who you're gonna spark. You know, that, that in our culture, that's just the way it goes. You just bring everybody together and you don't know who is going to be the one that has that passion, that spark, because with that passion comes the drive and the unbelievable, incredible amounts of, you know, emotion that'll, emotion that'll make it happen. And that's kind of where I think we're at. So I don't really have an answer. Maybe well, others. So, might. Well, I would I would just like to say something about how you approach um, native peoples, if wanting to work with them. Um, I think it's really commendable that you're w wanting to do this, and uh, it's also very important to follow their lead. And when you do that, but then in making the bridges, I think it's all it's can be very difficult because everybody carries stereotypes. You know, I mean that's just we just do. That's part of the human condition but to, as much as possible, put aside your assumptions about what that's gonna be like. We're just people, you know, we're just people, and we fight and we argue and we have fun and just like everybody else. So, but we do it differently. <laughs> so, um, and we do it the same. So, you know, I think that the, probably the most important thing is that I'm, I do a lot of conflict management training, and one of the tools that I use is to talk about um, what we call the heavy metal rules. One of them is the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you, which many systems of thought and religions uh, carry as a very important premise, and it is important. But that rule, the, the, the secret to using, or to opening up from that, is to know that that uh, assumes similarities. Mm -hmm. Okay, it assumes similarities. I mean, we want to go down I won't go through the whole thing, but you want to change that when you are trying to make intercultural connections into what we call the platinum rule, and that's do to others as they would have you do to them. How do you know that? Dialogue, yeah. you know, so you, but to put aside your assumptions and, um, and just talk. Mm -hmm. And go yeah, back to I, that old idea, too, that uh, 
when you mentioned social justice, that uh, no human being is an island, no one stands alone, that whatever we do, we do for one another. Sorry, Mike. Yeah, yeah I just, um, you know, that's a good question. Uh, and I think uh, Ben, for the most part, uh, you know, brought those um, out. And, and uh, I just uh, uh, really feel that uh, that, uh, you know, we uh, as tribal uh, peoples have uh, managed our lands and our waters for thousands of years, and we have that track record. And uh, for the most part, uh, uh, seems to me uh, the reason why people are starting to stand up and protest is because our voices are not being heard. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the answers, the traditional ecolo ecological knowledge that uh, we possess in our elders are not engaged in those preparations. Uh, for instance, when oil development is gonna occur, the um, industries or development of our resources are gonna be uh, occurring. Where are the tribes? The tribes are not there in uh, weighing um, uh, uh, in an uh, environmental um, impact uh, process, you know, health assessments and uh, impact assessments are not, uh, you know, taken in under consideration. But, um, but I think um, uh, the tribe, uh, there's state governments, there are tribal governments, and there's federal government, and there's industry. And I think uh, where um, uh, the tribes, uh, you know, there's over 100 tribes here in California. There's uh, over 200 tribes in Alaska, and there's more tribal governments, and they need to be on the table mm -hmm. before anything occurs and before we pay big time for it, so. I think we have one more, one more question. No more question. <laughs> Mine is, but we'll be around, so we can visit. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad you came.